Hello and welcome back. Okay, in the last audio video, I made these. So this is a single PCB, contains two channels, roughly of the design we built on breadboards, but we did modify the inputs a little bit, so it needs to take a whole 16-bit data group at once. And then we made two of those PCBs, so I've got four channels, and a testing of this was kind of limited to just throwing it some signals, and what I'd really like to do is build the interface logic necessary to get this interface back into the main CPU build so we can give it a proper run. Also, the output here, we've just got four lines that are outputting the analog signal from each of the channels. So we need to merge those together. And there's a few bits that were in the comments and discussion on Discord after that last video that I'd kind of like to take into account. Got some nice new breadboards. Let's see what we can do. Okay, so this is the original breadboard version of the audio circuit. So I've only got two channels on here. And this has the original plan of doing 16 bits as individual loads and then transferring over in one go. Now on the PCB version, we abandoned that plan because it was going to take twice as many latch chips. And instead I kind of bypassed the idea and just had 16 bits of data with a load line, which would be absolutely fine if I had a 16-bit data bus, but instead I'm going to need a control circuit that gives me a 16-bit-like data bus. Okay, so we saved eight latch chips here by not including that extra functionality. And in video five, I talked about various ways we could handle this 16-bit data update. And there was one particular comment that suggested a schema where we have uh, one byte we write for the address and then two bytes for the 16 bits of data. And I'm going to try and implement that because I think it's, um, it's worthwhile to explore it and uh, it's always nice to challenge yourself. Okay, first up, we're going to need a counter. Now I've got a 74LS193 here. That's an up-down counter, but um, I've got lots of these lying around both in the DIP and the SMD versions, so I need to use them up. I think I'm going to need two breadboards for this. Now we've got the parallel data in lines. I want to bring them all low. So we've got the parallel load line. That's active low, so I'm going to bring it high for now. Got a master reset line. That's active high, so we want it low. Got four output bits. We've got the count up and count down. Count down, I want to bring that high. The count up, we want to drive externally. So we kind of want to imagine this is the load line on our register. So let's connect that into our little bus test circuit. Let's get some LEDs in here to try and show the output. Okay, I think we've got everything we need to make it count there. Let's get some power. Okay, that's binary counting nicely. Now what we want to do is change this from a count with a 16 count cycle to one with a free count cycle. So we want this very simple, specify the address, load the low byte, load the high byte, and then flush it out onto the system. So we want a simple load the address of the register we're going to update, load the low byte, load the high byte, and actually update it. Three steps. Now, we could do that a bunch of different ways. We could use the down count functionality and initialize the counter to free, and then we've got the, the carry option when we hit zero. Or we could initialize our counter to a value up at the top end, so we've only got um, three steps before it rolls over, and use the carry to trigger a, a data load. And of course, that would actually work on a pure up counter, which is pretty good. Or we could use some external circuitry and keep the binary value nice and simple. And because we need some other work, I think that's worth doing. So I'm going to introduce a 74LS138 because we want to be able to do some addressing on those different states. And then we can actually use one of those addresses to um, handle the reset. 
I haven't done freeform circuit design like this for a little while, so uh, kind of enjoying it. We've got three lines here, which are our address. I'm going to take that from the low three lines of the counter. Now we should only actually need two lines to get up to three, but um, I'm going to address all three of them for now. So then we have two active low lines and an active high. And then we've got all our outputs here. OK, that's the first seven of them. The eighth is over here. I'm just going to have to pass that over. Now, these are numbered left to right. So that's counting nicely, but these are active low lines, so the LED goes out. We should be able to swap this around. That's good. So we can now clock it and go through the eight different outputs. And we're just like losing the top bit here because we're not referencing it. We can get rid of that. It has no relevance to us. We can get rid of the next line down because it also has no relevance to us. And we'll just pull it low over here. Now we just go through the four permutations. But we want that four to be free. If we take the fourth output and feed that into this parallel load line, I think that's going to do what we want. That's cool. So the moment it rolls over into the fourth position, issues the parallel load, that's going to load a zero. And we've got a nice little free option cycle there. If we imagine that this signal here that we're generating on the bus tester is the data load line for the audio control register, we're just going to run through three different options. So it's going to be load address, the low eight bits, load the high eight bits. I think I can make that permanent wire. I can take that out. And replace that with this. I've got those working right to left in the way that makes a bit more sense to us at the moment. We want to be loading data up during this first step because we want to load the register address. We want to load data during the second step because we want to load the low eight bits and then we want to load data here and trigger the register load. First step, we're going to want to pull data in on both of these first two steps. So we're going to need some data latches. All right, so I'm going to use the 574 D type latches. So we need power and ground. We're also going to need the output enable set. These are active low lines. And the top right pins on these are the loads. I need to cross connect these data input lines. Now I want to take data from the switches direct into here on my bus tester. So I'm going to take the assert for the switches direct to ground. That's cool. We want a active low load signal each time we do this, but the lines we've got coming out of the 138 demultiplexer are being held for the whole cycle. So I think what we need to do is also take the load line and put it into one of the active low enables. So that way it's actually only going to be active while the load is active. So we can use each of these as a load line over here. And I think I need to get some LEDs on as the output as well. These resistor arrays are a massive time saver for this. Let's give them some inputs. Let's take these load lines. And let's take them from the bus control for, for now. 
So I'm going to set all the switches. So we load this one and load this one. That's excellent. So now let's take this from the first line and this one from the second. Let's set the first four lines to zero. Press the button once and the first register loads. Again, second register loads. And on the third one, what I'd like to do is have this select the appropriate load line here. Then we can connect this register to one half of the 16-bit data, but connect the main bus directly to the other half because at the point where we're loading it there, we've got all 16 bits. So we only need the two latch chips at this end. So it's address, low eight bits, high eight bits will be on the main bus at this point, sorted. Okay, so now we need to work out how we're gonna take an address from here to control which line we're loading. Now, pretty obvious I expect, but uh, let's go for a 138 demultiplexer again. You note I've got the positioning of these chips exactly wrong, so everything's going off at an angle. We need the address lines here. Now it's kind of annoying that the order here is the reverse way around to the order here. It makes cutting wires for this a little bit more difficult. So now we've got two active low enable lines. And an active high enable line. Okay, I want to get some visibility onto these lines as well. It's kind of a big decision to work out which of these sets of LEDs we're going to bother putting onto a PCB. But it's the first four of these that are important to us because that's what we're going to have going over to the audio board. So this is the address and only the bottom two bits of this, well, actually bottom three bits of this are relevant and we're only actually going to see an LED lit for the bottom two bits. Right, so let's see if we can dry run the operation a little bit. So firstly, we want to write to the I.O. port the address of the audio register we want to modify. So I'm going to say we want to write to address 2. We're going to set 2 on the bus, and that's the data write we're going to make. So the 2's come over here. Now I want to output FF to set all the bits, which is what we would do to disable the channel. So the next write we do will be of 255. So once more, we would then write 255 again, which will be the other half of the channel. And that's when we would expect the load to happen. So we need the third load line here to go momentarily low during that third load operation. So in this case, we're gonna take that third line here on the demultiplexer and feed it into an active low on here. Right, so let's do this again, only this time we want to load the third register. Or register four, which is gonna have the address free. So we load that, it's the address here. Now nothing's changed over here yet. And since these are actually the load lines now for the audio channel circuit, we don't want anything to check to happen here until we're actually ready with the correct 16 bits to load into that channel. So now I'm just gonna set a semi-random binary pattern for the low eight bits. Set a slightly different random pattern for the high eight bits. And now the appropriate line here has gone low. Excellent. Okay, I think we've got our main circuit working now. So this, this can generate the, the, the correct signals by writing to the single IO port. We specify the address, low eight bits, high eight bits, and the load would be triggered into the channel's PCB. And there's just one other problem that I foresee. And that is, if we power cycle this, there's no guarantee what counter value we currently have in the 193. That's usually zero at first power on, but we have seen it be completely random values. And we want our code to be absolutely sure which state this is in. Now you remember on this board, what we actually did is we were using the write to push data 
the load to push data, but then we used the assert, i.e. the read back, which we had no direct purpose for, other than to just use it to flush the data from the holding position into the actual usage registers. Now we don't need that with this schema at all, but we do need some kind of a signal to make sure that the counter state is exactly where we want. I've got an idea for this, which I think might be quite clever. Right, we've got a master reset on the counter right there. And what I'm gonna suggest we do is we take that from the top bit of the address. So now, instead of setting an address, if we just set 128, so the top bit set, that line goes high, so the, the master reset is high. I'm gonna use a slightly longer line. But every time we load here, it just stays selecting this first position. So that way, if we set that first bit and write it at least three times, we know for a fact, because it, once it gets to the address load state, it's not going to move on. So we write 128 to the port three times, then we want to zero that out, write a zero, and now we know it's in the state ready to load the register address. So let's load register one, stick 255 into the low eight bits and then the same into the upper eight bits and when we click the the load line for the audio control register we should then get a load on the second register into the channel circuit awesome okay let's think about how successful this is to save space on these PCBs, what we basically did was we took out another row of registers. So that's a total of eight D-type latches. So it's exactly this replicated. And we've replaced it with these five chips, which is two D-type latches and one counter and two demultiplexers. So it's roughly equivalent to these three chips here. So ignoring the LEDs, but we're probably gonna want some, we need a circuit of that size to handle the data loading. So actually this whole process has been really successful and um, kind of kicking myself because this is clearly a better way of doing than what we had before because we could say switch this from four circuits up to eight circuits and you know, we wouldn't have to replicate any of this. Um, this would handle um, a lot more. In fact, in hindsight, we could have used this 16-bit uh, register load in the VJ, although it was good to do the um, memory mapped I.O. for that just uh, as an experimentation. Okay, let's see where we can go with this. I don't quite want to destroy this circuit until we know this is all working. So let's construct a new clock. Right, so here's the clock over there. Our channel loads go into the first four lines there. We're going to want power and ground across. All right, now I think I will have to uh, steal at least a DuPont cable from here. Now I do kind of have to make a choice here as to which way around the low and the high half is going to go. I've been saying the low first. So let's actually stick with that. But when we come to write the code, it might become obvious that another one is more convenient. So as the low half goes in there, and now I'm just daisy chaining our bus substitute into the upper eight bits. And right, let's give this a proper test. So firstly, we just set that top bit. So three times should be enough to be sure what state we're in. Then we clock it out. Let's try and set the first register. So address here zero, that's not changed. And I want to set all the bits in the low. And then in the high, I want to set the bottom four bits, which is gonna be the upper four bits here, but I'm gonna zero out the top four bits. That should actually set the channel volume to the max. Hey! Okay, um, I like it. Let's do the second channel. So setting the address to one, that's correct. So this time I think I'm gonna set everything to zero in the frequency select, but let's set the volume to 
Okay. Okay. This is really cool. So I don't. I can't actually remember how well we tested all of the the separate channels, but uh, it's giving a little bit of a workout before we uh, actually generate some sound. So now we want the third channel. That's binary two on the address. And what should we do here? Um, let's just set alternate bits. And I'm going to set that to both halves just because specifying different values doesn't make much difference to us at this point. It's exactly what we, what we wanted. So now finally we set free binary as the address, which is the fourth channel. And I'm going to set every other bit the other way. Okay, so now I just noticed that I didn't have the uh, LEDs at the top here recorded, but you would have seen these change, so we're all good. But I think in terms of the digital interface, we've, we've proven the circuit is working there, um, and I am very happy with that. Now, these four lines are bringing the signal back out, and I kind of want to spend a little bit of different time working out the circuitry on that. All right, so firstly, I'm just gonna take all four of those outs to there. So I've got them; those signals merged together. How am I going to test this? Okay, so this should be the mixed output from the four channels. Let's just hook the scope up, see what we're getting. Okay, that certainly looks like we've got a bunch of waves added together. Now, in the last video when I showed the output, I built this little piece of circuit, which was generating a negative five volt rail. So we could have plus or minus five volts as the power rails to the op amp here. And then that would give us a plus or minus five volt swing on the audio signal coming out. And in that video, I incorrectly said plus or minus five volts was the line output. And lots of people jumped in to tell me that that was wrong. Um, it's actually plus or minus two and a half volts. So we've actually got the right range on the board already. And I was also suggested that I should be using something called a DC blocking capacitor in order to get the output independent of um, the floating ground rail in between um, ground and five volts, which is what we're currently outputting. So I'm going to have a crack at putting that circuit together and, uh, and let's see what we get. All right, so let's get the op amp in here. All right, so we're going to get power and ground in. It's opposite corners, just like on the TTL chips. We've got the two unused inputs we want to tie to ground. Okay, so the configuration we're going to use for the op amp this time is just going to be a simple buffer because we want to separate the audio output from all of the resistors in the network back here. Right, so the positive input needs to come from our circuit here. Our negative input, we actually connect direct to the output. That provides the feedback. And then our output is there. So we've got very similar output, which is what we'd expect. But if we connect some circuitry up here, we shouldn't be uh, messing around with it so much. That's our output and that's our ground. We should be able to get sound out of there. I'm going to try 100 nanofarad. That does indeed look like the output is varying around the zero line. Okay, that's actually kind of cool. Um, hopefully that's going to, going to work effectively. Now this is probably going to be some awful screech coming out of here. I've got no idea what I coded in there. I don't think there's anything to do but interface this back to the CPU and actually try and drive it properly. Got some coding to do and I'm going to have to reorganise my desk a little bit to, uh, to fit this in. Okay, so I've got the CPU build out. Now the temporary backplanes means there's slightly more spacing here than we actually need. But we're starting to 
run out of space down here. So the circuitry we've built, I would like to fit into a fairly thin strip here. But with the component count, I don't think that's going to be particularly difficult. And then we've got one more little space down at the bottom for uh, another circuit and a spare set of our IO lines for it as well. All right, I think we need to grab the interface line. This is the IO port. So the first two lines are power and ground, we could do with that. And then the third line is the load line. And that's the only one we actually use on this circuit. I think that's enough. We don't need this power lead anymore. Should get enough power from this. I think that's everything we need. Right, so copied the bootloader ROM over. So the first thing we can need to do is write some code to handle the initialization. Remember, we've got a initialization series of operations we want to do. So we want to output 128, and we don't know which of the outputs it's going to go into when we, we load it, because we've got no idea what the current state of the counter is. But because we output from this point into the reset, we output it three times, and we know that we're, we're gonna be in this first state Okay, we did have this audio init function before, so we can call that, but we've got a more complicated sequence of events. So output A, so we assign 128 into A, output that three times, and we're assigned zero to A. Now, I think we also want to reset all the channels. Now, when we powered it up then, they all started up in a random state, so it should be nice and obvious this is working. Now to set the volume to zero, we actually want to output zero F zero. So this is the upper byte we want, the lower byte, and that's the address. So we output the address, then the low eight bits and the upper eight bits. So that should reset the first channel. Between each of these operations, we want to increment B. Actually, there we know that A is already zero. It's just going to be more sense for us to do this. Okay, so a bit more work there, but I believe that will reset all the channels to volume off and zero in the counter. Right, let's try this again. Okay, well, that's not really helping. These are all zero that we'd expect. Okay, so I've just spent two minutes debugging that without realizing that I haven't plugged the wire in. So that seems to produce the right value for the rest of these uh, channels. Let's just try running that again. And now it's all initialized. Okay, that was a total waste of my time. I just forgot to add this cable because of course we need the main bus connection. Okay, I perhaps actually need to add that initialization to my boot ROM um, that brings it into the loader because we don't want um, the audio circuit putting out random noises just due to initialization. But other than that, I think we've got a process that works. I think, um, I think we can test that one step further just by explicitly outputting a bit more data. Shouldn't need to reinitialize that start after calling audio in it. Let's try doing exactly the same thing again, but we'll set some more interesting data. Okay, let's give that a go. What we should be doing there is just setting the volume on the channels to, to two more for each sequential channel, which is exactly what we've got. Let's hope we actually got the audio output circuit correct and we're actually going to get the tones we expect. No idea if that's the correct sound for uh, this value of the frequency registers. 
But um, I think what we need to do now is load some code back up, work out how to convert some MIDI data over and give that a, a bit of a better go. Okay, this is what I've come up with. I've got the pretty straightforward audio code that I was running before for two channel data, but I've just adapted it to handle four channels of data. This means that the data size is getting a lot bigger. The other thing I've done is I've used the VGA wait new VBL function to implement timing. So that means we can actually get a fairly consistent timing rate based on the vertical refresh rate. So that means I've had to modify the time base to 1 60th of a second. But other than that, this is pretty much the same code. And we can kind of see there's a very strong consistency in the pattern of the data here when we look at it. So I think we're going to have to implement some kind of data structure to this, which specifies which channels have changed. Okay, so let's take a look at that and demonstrate what we can do now with all four channels operating. Okay, that is absolutely epic. Now, I particularly like the way this is showing up almost like a VU meter as the assignment between the notes and the channels changes. Okay, that, that is uh, even better than I'd hoped when I started making this synthesizer. Now I do actually think we can get better sound out of this than we're currently doing with the converted MIDI tracks, but I think we need to get this uh, finalized onto a PCB and in the intervening time, I can spend a bit of uh, time experimenting and seeing exactly what we can do with this. I am extremely pleased with the progress today. It sounds good and the LEDs look great as well to boot. I'm quite excited to see what uh, I can actually make this do when I move beyond basic MIDI files. The data at the moment is it's kind of too big because I'm just storing raw channel output data. And so some kind of uh, reduction schema that's a bit smarter would be good. At the moment, the tune I've just played is, is quite large. But if we take what we've got now and compare it to the early versions of fur release we've played, the extra channels and the extra attention to the audio output circuitry really shows through. Very much hope you found this interesting. I'm really pleased with this. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.